and um, you get to go into the hall, and um, uh, I've met Warren, and, um, uh, but it's, it's a fascinating meeting to go to, listen to them talk, uh, but it's during graduation, our graduation. It's just hard to get people to break away and, and go, but it's worth it. So here's You're in Good Hands, Allstate. But these guys are, have been advertising more aggressively than anybody in the last couple of years with the, um, the emu. Um, farmers, you know, you know farmers, if you watch any golf, you know, Ricky Fowler's in there, and so. All right, just some names you might be familiar with. Familiar with. All right, so the organizational form of insurance companies. All right, stock insurers. Stock insurers. Well, this is what Berkshire Hathaway owns. Stock companies. Okay? And then there's mutual and other. And when I said there are really two forms, stock and mutual, dominate. And stock, there are more stock companies than mutual companies. All right, some other types. Lloyd's of London will uh, detail these in just a minute. Reciprocal exchanges. Is it really worth knowing? Probably not. Okay, Blue Cross and Blue Shield, now that's worth knowing. Okay because they are the dominant health insurance uh, company on the planet. Blue Cross Blue Shield, okay? HMOs, okay, whoops. All right, so let's get into more detail about these different types of insurance operations. Because these, the, it'll be on the test, and if you go to get licensed, you'll have to know this as well. All right, so, um, here are the number of stock uh, companies, okay, and then the number of mutual companies, and then we'll talk about what a fraternal company is. But really, these two are the most important. And then, um, so this is, ah, hold on, where we go? Uh, life insurers, is that a repeat? What's different about this? Number. I don't know. Hold on. It's just looking like a repeat. Yeah. It's just a repeat. Okay. Oh, that's what I wanted to get here. Okay, and so um, uh, this is by, is that assets or is that? Revenue policies written. Includes stock companies. I'm not sure. Includes payments to beneficiaries. I'm not exactly sure if that's if those are by assets or by revenues. But you can see. Um, oh, I'm looking right at it. So this is the amount of benefits. Um, and here are the assets. Here are the assets. So you can see that stock dominates. Okay? And even though there were 81 fraternal compared to 106 mutual, you can see that the assets are tiny. So do you even need to know that? No, you don't. Not really. Now they're out there, and we'll mention a couple of them, a couple of names, just so you'll know. Because you'll, you'll run into them from time to time. Okay, so what is a stock insurer? Stock insurer is a corporation that is owned by stockholders, okay? And the objective is like any other private sector company, earn a profit for stockholders by increasing the value of the stock. Well, how do you do that? By increasing the cash flows. Okay? And by paying dividends. Again, both driven by your cash flows. Your revenues, less your expenses. Your cash flows. Okay? And you want to, so you want to sell more and more and more and control your expenses and make higher net income. 
That's the goal of a stock-owned insurance company. Okay. And so the stockholders elect the board of directors like any other company. It's the stockholders who elect the board. And see, this is where Warren Buffett, people say, I want to invest like Warren Buffett. You can't. You can't. Why? Because Warren Buffett has accumulated enough money that Warren Buffett is not a passive investor. Like, you can own 100 shares of Walmart, right? And you can even go to the Walmart annual meeting. But if you go to Walmart corporate and you say, I want to meet with the chief financial officer because I have some thoughts that I want to share about how to improve Walmart, you think you're going to get that meeting? No. But when you're the single largest shareholder at Walmart, you think the CFO is going to take a meeting with you? Yes. And when you say, I think that y'all ought to increase your, your, um, the wages that you pay to people. Just the Walmart just announced they're increasing wages for 165,000 people, um, which is a small compared to the number of people they have. But that's Warren Buffett. He's an active investor. Okay, so he cuts deals that nobody else gets. All right? He's on the board. All right. So at the end of the day, it's the stockholders who have the money at risk. Okay? The company goes under, you're going to lose your investment. All right. And a stock insurer cannot issue what's called an assessable policy. Okay? What is an assessable policy? It's a, a policy that enables the insurer to make the insured so when you buy the policy, if you buy a policy, you are the insured. If you sell a policy, you are the insurer. So an assessable policy is sold by an insurer, but the person or organization that buys an assessable policy is liable for losses that exceed the reserves of the insurance company. Okay? So it is a form of self-insurance or retention. So you've got to be real careful if you buy an accessible policy. Are there a lot of them out there? No, they're not. But it's just something to be aware of. If someone says, hey, we've got an accessible policy that will cost you a lot less, then you need to be very careful with that. Because you could have a loss and you're not covered. Okay. So this could keep the insurance, this is good for the insurance company, could keep them afloat. Why do they do it? Well, it's, it's sharing risk. It's risk sharing. Okay. All right, if you own a policy that is issued by a stock company, you could buy stock in that company, okay? But there is a separation between the policy and the stock. Okay? So as an individual, you can either buy a policy from that company and or you could buy stock in that company. But they are separate decisions. Okay? So you can own a policy without owning stock or you can own stock without owning a policy. But we're getting ready to look at mutual, the mutual form, and that's very different. Very different. All right. So a mutual insurer is a company that is owned by the policy owners. If you buy a policy, you own a piece of the company. The policy and the stock are together. And that's what Northwestern Mutual is. Northwestern Mutual. Okay. New York Life State Farm, they are a stockholding stock companies. Northwestern Mutual is a mutual company. All right, policy owners elect the board. Not stockholders, policy owners. Okay, and the board manages the company. All right, policyholders may receive dividends or rate reductions 
if the company earns a profit. If you own stock, if you own a policy in, a, in Northwestern Mutual, and they pay you a dividend, that dividend that they pay you is not taxable to you because it is considered to be a return of your premium. A return of your premium. But if you own stock in a stock uh, insurance company and they pay you a dividend, even if you own a policy from that company, it is considered to be income. Okay? Dividends paid by mutual companies to policyholders are not taxable because they're considered to be premium refunds. And that's a question on the licensing exam. It's also a question on this exam. You need to remember that. Okay? Three main types of mutuals. Advanced premium, okay? That does not issue assessable policies. Is this really that important? No, it's really not. But it's on there, these are details. I'm just telling you what's really important for you to know and what's more just kind of detail-oriented, not that important. Everybody up with me? Okay. Okay. An assessment mutual okay, has the right to assess policyholders an additional amount so they come back to the policyholders and say, we need you to kick in more money. Okay. And then we have a fraternal insurer. And it's kind of like a credit union in that it is really set up for members of an organization. So you have to be a member of the organization, you know, used to be. More, it's more publicly traded now, or public, uh, more of a public operation, but it was set up for members to provide a benefit. One of the benefits of being a member of AARP is you get access to special insurance products at special rates that you don't get access to if you're not a member. Okay? And that's a fraternal organization. Alright. So, Woodman of the World, one of my clients, uses Woodman of the World for their insurance. And you don't have to be any special member. It started off serving a special group, and then they decided to just go ahead and sell products to everybody. And thrive it. And you, you might have noticed uh, these names on one of the lists, they're, they're pretty large, but they're small compared to the stock companies. Anybody ever heard of Woodman of the World? Yeah. In, a, in an urban area, you won't hear about it. But in rural areas, you'll hear about Woodman of the World. All right. All right. So more and more companies are becoming stock. Okay. So, uh, part of this is due to consolidation. Stock companies have access to more capital. Okay. They can raise more money. They sell stock. They have more capital. So, one of the things they do with their capital is they go out and they buy other companies. So, they go out and they buy mutual companies and fraternal companies, and those become part of a stock-owned company. Okay. <clears throat> Then there's demutualization, okay, where you take a mutual company and turn it into a stock insurer. convert for tax purposes and efficiency into a stock insurer. 
So the point of all of this is to say that stock corporations have really grown and mutual corporations have shrunk. That's the whole point of this. Am I going to ask you a question about a mutual holding company? It is not an insurance company. People think it's an insurance company, but it's not. It's really a, an insurance marketplace. It's a cooperative. It's a group of insurance companies that have gathered together. Okay? A type of insurance market where consumers of insurance go to find companies that will underwrite their risk and where insurers pool the risks that they underwrite. So, they do a lot of strange and unique policies. So, um, if you ever turn on a golf tournament, or if you've ever been to a golf tournament, and it says, if you get a hole in one, you win this brand new car. Okay? And you think, well, that is so nice that the local Ford dealership, or the local BMW dealership is going to give somebody who makes a hole-in-one a car. That's not how it works. The dealership gets an insurance policy. They buy a policy from Lloyd's of London. They specialize. Lloyd's of London specializes in this kind of deal. And they might pay $500 to Lloyd's of London. And if somebody gets a hole-in-one, the dealership gives the car to that person and then collects on the value of that car from Lloyd's of London. That's how it works. So the premium, like all other premiums, reflects the um, likely, what's called the expected value, the probability uh, of the event times the value of the, of the event. Uh, and and uh, so everybody's okay. So the dealership doesn't flinch if, you know, if somebody gets a hole in one, it's Lloyd's of London who flinches. Okay. All right. So there are lots of different groups that are members of Lloyd's. There are corporations. There are companies that are members, and there are individual uh, members. There are limited partnerships. Okay. And they all agree to cover a certain dollar amount or percentage of losses. It's a big cooperative group of insurers who are sharing losses. It's all about pooling and risk sharing. <clears throat> so they can take on losses and risks. They can write policies together as a group that they couldn't individually. And that's why they do it. Lloyds of London. All right. So if you're going to be a member, you, you've got to have deep pockets. If you say, I'm going to guarantee you know, $5 billion worth of losses, you, you've got to be able to show that you can come up with the money if, if there are losses. Okay. And um, so in the U.S., and we'll get into this, um, insurance is regulated on a state-by-state -state basis. So if you want to operate in a state, you have to be admitted to into the state to do business. Okay. All right. I think we'll go two more. All right. So what's a reciprocal exchange? Not a lot of these around anymore. Okay. But it's an organization um, similar to Lloyd's. Okay. It's, an, it's a, it's a co-op, okay? And it's, why do people do it? Again, it's for pooling and risk sharing purposes. What, what else do we need to know? And I know this was, all of this was on the CFP exam, by the way, the section on insurance. 
Okay, you had to know a little bit about reciprocal exchanges, but again, they're small. You know, why do we really need to know? Uh, let's see if there's. Um, uh, yeah, we'll stop with Blue Cross. So there's not a whole lot of, of data information about them because they're they're just tiny. They're just tiny. So we're going to stop with Blue Cross Blue Shield here. All right. Blue Cross, who's heard of Blue Cross Blue Shield? Everybody. Harding um, uses Blue Cross Blue Shield to administer our, our uh, insurance, our health insurance, but not to insure our health insurance. Harding is self-insured, okay? We retain our risk. So we all pay into a pool, okay? And, but um, the payment and all the record keeping is done by Blue Cross Blue Shield. They call it their Blue Advantage program, where they come to Harding and they say, we'll do all the record keeping for you, and we'll make sure that the money, the benefits are paid to the a medical provider, but you guys have to come up with the money. Y'all have to have a pool that we can draw from to pay. Why do we do it that way? Because it's cheaper for Harding to self-insure. Okay. Uh, generally organized as nonprofit, which means that they don't pay income taxes. They pay. Um, they do pay. There are a couple of profit, for-profit Blue Cross Blue Shield, but um, they're set up like um, like Harding is. Okay. They're a health insurance company, but they're not set up to pay. Um, uh, income taxes. So started way back in 1929 for Baylor University. Okay. All right. So in the 60s, when the government got involved, see, doctors until the 70s, doctors didn't make big money in America. Okay. It wasn't until the 70s when the U.S. government got into the healthcare business through Medicare that doctors started making big money. So if you look at old movies and the doctor comes in at 10 o'clock at night carrying a bag and he goes into somebody's bedroom making a house call, you know, he might have gotten paid $10 for his services. Okay? Now the doctors today is like a house call. And every now and then you find somebody, my, we, we use a doctor who when Ben played football and he got sick and the doctor says, well, I'm, we call the doctor and we bring Ben by in the morning. He said, I'm getting ice cream right now. I'll just come by the house and check him out and gave him a Z-Pack, a prescription for the Z-Pack. Didn't charge us anything. Doctors still do that, but uh, not many of them. Okay. So Medicare was created in the 60s. Okay, so Social Security was created in the 40s and Medicare was created in the 60s. What are the two biggest pieces of the federal budget? Well, Medicare and Social Security. Okay, so you got to be really careful when you create these programs. All right, and we'll study Medicare, but what is Medicare? Well, Medicare is a, a 